Welcome back to Arkansas, where we try to make sense of the issues affecting Arkansans, and today we're going to talk about Arkansas's abortion laws. On May 2nd, 2022, a draft of a Supreme Court decision leaked, indicating the court will likely overturn the Roe v. Wade abortion rules. And back in 2019, Arkansas passed an abortion ban, which immediately takes effect if that happens. So today, we're going to cover what abortion is, the history of abortion laws in Arkansas, the new law that goes into effect when Roe is overturned, and the potential impact it will have on the state. The abortion issue is incredibly complex, existing at the intersection of biology, politics, and ethics, and that's without even getting into the deeply personal stories involved. This video is not intended to present an argument for whether abortion should be legal, when life begins, or any other subjective opinions. It's only meant to show how those opinions have shaped the politics and laws of Arkansas. As always, if you want to skip to a specific section of the video, you can do so by using the links in the description. So, let's start with some definitions, which requires some biology. When a human sperm reaches an egg, it's called fertilization. And once an egg is fertilized, the single cell begins to multiply as it travels down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. This newly multiplying bundle of cells is now called an embryo. About eight days after fertilization, the embryo will try to implant on the uterine wall. If it's successful, it will continue growing, and for around seven weeks it will keep creating new cells which will differentiate into the first building blocks of all the different body parts. But at around eight weeks after fertilization, all those starting pieces are in place, and development shifts from starting new projects to continuing development on what's already begun. This marks the change from an embryo to a fetus, and that term applies from this point until birth or termination. Humans have certain biological triggers that can sometimes cause the body to end a pregnancy. For instance, infections or problems with development. This can also happen as a result of a pregnant woman doing strenuous physical activity or ingesting things that mess with embryonic or fetal development. Anytime a pregnancy is ended before the fetus could have survived being born, it's called a miscarriage. So now let's define abortion. In biology, the term abortion refers to any time an embryo or fetus leaves the womb before it's fully developed, regardless of whether that's done purposely. So the biological definition of abortion includes unintentional miscarriages. But very generally speaking, governments can only make laws about things you have some level of control over. So when it comes to laws for or against abortions, unintentional miscarriages are usually not included. So for the rest of this video, the term abortion will only refer to the conscious, purposeful termination of an embryo or fetus prior to live birth. And one final thing. If you've heard of pregnancy happening in trimesters, or lasting 40 weeks, both of those are counting gestational age. Gestational age starts with a woman's last period, since the timing of that is easy to know and the timing of when fertilization happened is not. Fertilization can only happen during a brief window about two weeks after the last period. Weirdly, by this metric, someone who was fertilized today would already be two weeks pregnant. It's important to remember that most sources, and most laws, will use gestational age. By that counting, a woman's first missed period, often the first sign of pregnancy, is at the four-week mark. That effectively means abortions aren't even an option for the first month of pregnancy. All of that advanced medical knowledge about the specifics of human pregnancy and early development is relatively recent, but humans have been performing abortions for far longer. We have written records from as early as 1550 BC of people purposely inducing abortions by doing physically strenuous activities like weightlifting or diving. The same goes for ingesting plants, what we'd now call a medication abortion, as well as early attempts to use tools to remove the fetus or embryo, now called surgical abortions. Early laws regarding abortion varied a lot from culture to culture, and those laws sometimes didn't differentiate between abortions and what we'd now consider birth control, owing in part to a lack of widespread understanding of exactly how pregnancy happens. And even once biologists had a decent understanding, it took a while for that knowledge to have any effect on abortion laws. So, in 1776, when the U.S. broke away from England, plenty of new laws were written about how our country would be governed, but on some things, America just copied England's homework, and that includes abortion. Under English common law, abortions were not legal after the quickening, or the point around four or five months into a pregnancy when a woman begins to feel fetal movement. That was considered the law in America, too, until around the 1820s, when some states began to codify or enhance these laws. 
Arkansas became a state in 1836, and one year later, the state passed its first abortion laws, making it illegal to perform an abortion after the quickening, except to save the life of the mother. It also made it illegal to sell drugs or tools which could be used for that purpose. However, in 1875, the state rewrote the laws to be much more strict, making abortion illegal at all points during pregnancy, with a possible punishment of up to five years in prison and a fine of $1,000, the equivalent of about $2,600 in 2022. Once again, the only exception was the health of the mother, but there was plenty of gray area there. For example, what about mental health? Was a mother who might endanger herself or her child allowed to get an abortion? Or what about tuberculosis patients? During the time when TB was widespread in Arkansas, a woman with TB who gave birth lived for only about two more years on average. But did the health risk clause only cover immediate issues? Arkansas doctors, courts, and the legislature would continue to argue those and other questions for the entire time the law was in effect, nearly 100 years. But in the 1950s, some big changes came to popular views on abortion in the U.S. Around this time, information and personal stories about women going to extreme means to obtain abortions, sometimes with disastrous consequences, began to circulate in mainstream media, and one of those reports was from the University of Arkansas Medical School. At the time, Lysol, the kitchen cleaning product, was also advertised as a feminine hygiene product and, more covertly, as a way to prevent or end a pregnancy. But in 1956, physicians at UAMS published a paper detailing how women who used Lysol internally were suffering severe injuries and sometimes even death. At the time when this and similar stories began to spread in popular media, some states had laws that prevented not just abortions, but even contraceptives, things like condoms intended to stop fertilization from happening in the first place. And those laws were expanded to also ban the newest form of birth control, the pill. In 1960, the very first birth control pill was approved by the FDA. That pill, and most hormonal birth control since then, prevents pregnancy by doing some combination of three things. They slow down or prevent ovulation, so there may not be an egg to fertilize. They thicken the mucus in the cervix, which makes it harder for sperm to reach an egg. And they change the lining of the womb, so it's harder for a fertilized egg to implant. The ready availability of safe birth control exacerbated public frustration over the stories of home abortions, and legal action was quick to follow. On a state level, the Arkansas abortion ban was rewritten, expanding exceptions to include life or health endangerment, rape, incest, or fetal deformity. On a federal level, the first big change came in 1965 when the Supreme Court ruled that states could not keep married couples from using contraceptives. And in 1972, they expanded that to unmarried couples as well. And then, in 1973, Roe v. Wade hit the Supreme Court. The Roe v. Wade case involved a woman living in Texas who already had two children and found out she was pregnant with a third. The abortion laws in Texas at the time were much like Arkansas's. No abortion at any point in the pregnancy, minus a specific set of exceptions. The woman sued Texas for the right to end her pregnancy, and the case was decided in 1973 with judges ruling 7-2 to two against the Texas law. But the reasons behind that decision were much broader. The court ruled that there exists a right to privacy, which is not explicitly stated in the Constitution, but instead is implied by guarantees that are explicit. The court said that state or federal governments forcing a woman to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term could have long-term negative effects on not just her private life, but also the private lives of her family and eventually the child. So, if a right to privacy is implied by the Constitution, and if a ban on abortions infringes on that right to privacy, then an abortion ban is unconstitutional. However, the court also ruled that the right to privacy, just like any other right, is not absolute, especially when it conflicts with other guaranteed rights. The moment a baby is born in the U.S., it has full rights and legal protections, but the court rejected the idea that those rights come into full effect at the moment of fertilization or the moment of birth, or any other single clearly definable instant. Instead, the court said there needed to be a sliding scale, a way to acknowledge full privacy rights of the mother at the start of pregnancy, full personhood rights to the fetus at the end, and a gradient in between. And to do so, they introduced the trimester framework. The trimester framework takes the average nine-month pregnancy, divides it up into three three-month periods, and sets different levels of legal protection for each trimester. During the first trimester, the privacy rights of the pregnant woman are most important, and the only laws that can be imposed are the ones intended to make abortions safe. 
During the second trimester, abortion procedures become more risky, so the court said that states could impose some restrictions, but only ones that were reasonable and narrowly tailored to protecting the mother's health. But during the third trimester, the court said that the rights of the fetus were strong enough that states could ban almost all abortions except those necessary to protect the health or life of the mother. But why does the justification for this one case matter? Well, in the United States, judges decide cases not just based on the civil laws passed by governments, but also on previous court rulings and the justifications behind them, especially if those rulings came from the same court or one at an even higher level. And the Supreme Court is as high as it gets. Once a court has made its decision, that decision and the legal reasoning behind it has to be followed by both courts and governments under that court's jurisdiction. Practically speaking, this means that courts have the power to make laws. Past court decisions that serve as guidance for future cases are called precedents, and the more frequently a precedent has been used to inform other decisions, the stronger and more law-like it's assumed to be. The passage of Roe and the trimester standard becoming precedent meant that the Arkansas abortion laws were overturned entirely for the first and second trimester. The number of abortions in Arkansas rose drastically, from 1,694 in 1974 to 6,059 in 1979. They were mostly obtained by white single women and done within the first trimester. This reflected the national trend as well. 1980 was the year with the largest number of abortions in the U.S., topping off at about 1.6 million, or about 347 abortions for every 1,000 live births. Before Roe, abortion had not been a politically or religiously one-sided issue in America. In fact, some Protestant groups had come out in favor of abortion rights, lining themselves up against the anti-abortion Catholics. But in the years after Roe, as the number of abortions began to rise, there was social backlash, popular opinions began to shift, and political strategists decided to capitalize on this. Republicans were in a weak political spot following the resignation of Richard Nixon and decided they could capture new voters if they could get the previously split Christian voting bloc to unite against abortion. So in 1976, overturning Roe v. Wade became part of the official Republican platform. For four years, they hammered it hard, and in 1980, their new coalition of voters successfully swung elections and handed the presidency to Ronald Reagan. It's around this time that the messaging around abortions begins to lose nuance. Both sides begin frequently speaking as if the only options are a total abortion ban or a total lack of restrictions, even though Roe was somewhere in between. There was also a split in terminology. Those in favor of abortions generally use more medical terminology, like embryo and fetus, while those against abortion use terms like preborn child or unborn baby. And anti-abortion protesters began frequently using images and descriptions of second or third trimester fetal abortions as if they represented most abortions, when in fact the vast majority were being performed in the first trimester on embryos. The messaging was effective, and the Roe decision had left some wiggle room for interpretation of what restrictions were reasonable or medically necessary. So opponents quickly began to pass state and federal laws in order to tighten restrictions as far as would be allowed. For example, in 1980, Congress enacted the Hyde Amendment, which blocked the use of federal funds to pay for abortions at any stage of pregnancy, except in the case of rape, incest, or the mother's health. The Hyde Amendment initially took away abortion coverage from recipients of Medicaid, government-funded health insurance for the extremely poor. But the Hyde Amendment had to be renewed every year, and over the years it was rewritten. In different versions, it would drop or re-add the exceptions for rape and incest. It was also expanded beyond Medicaid to exclude more women from abortion coverage, including inmates, federal workers, and women in the military. On a state level, abortion restrictions took many forms. In Arkansas, licenses for abortion clinics were made incredibly expensive to obtain or renew. The state also put a number of requirements on both doctors and patients which were meant to discourage abortions, and in 1988, the state adopted Arkansas Constitutional Amendment 68, which says the official policy of Arkansas is, quote, to protect the life of every unborn child from conception until birth to the extent permitted by the federal constitution. Following Roe, anti-abortion activists and political groups knew that each new set of justices on the Supreme Court could potentially overturn the Roe ruling, and it was important that it happen as soon as possible because the longer a precedent stands, the harder it usually is to overturn. 
So Republican-controlled states continued to make laws that violated Roe's restrictions with the intent to appeal them all the way up to the Supreme Court in the hope of overturning Roe. Despite the large number of cases challenging it, Roe remained largely unchanged through the 70s and 80s. The Supreme Court's position was, generally, that states could not discourage abortions that were legal under Roe, but state personnel and facilities couldn't be used to provide them either. But then, in 1992, a huge change to Roe came in the form of Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which challenged a set of abortion restrictions in Pennsylvania. In their decision, the Supreme Court reversed direction, allowing for things like state-sponsored anti-abortion materials and forced waiting periods. And while the court upheld the basic idea of Roe, that very early abortions should be mostly legal and later abortions could be strictly regulated, they did away with the trimester framework entirely. Casey created a new framework, which relies on more recent medical advances to determine a point of fetal viability or the point during a pregnancy at which a fetus has a better than 50% chance to survive if it were delivered right then. The chances for a fetus to survive a preterm birth dramatically increase over a period of about two weeks in the middle of a pregnancy. Fetal viability jumps from around 55% at 23 weeks to between 60 and 70% at 24 weeks. In the Casey ruling, the court said that this new understanding of fetal viability meant that the line where it became okay for states to make very restrictive abortion laws was to be moved earlier, from 28 weeks to around 23 weeks. But the court also said that the line could change if continuing research showed viability occurred sooner or later. As for abortions performed before fetal viability, the court said states could make some restrictions for the first 22 weeks, but that those restrictions couldn't place an undue burden on women seeking abortions. But the Supreme Court was deeply divided in this decision, with some justices voting yes on part of the decision and no on other parts, and two of them even argued that Roe should be overturned entirely. It's important to keep in mind that the Casey ruling functions as a kind of amendment to Roe v. Wade, meaning if Roe were struck down, Casey would be as well. Outside of the court, public feelings and discussions about abortion weren't nearly so nuanced. As abortion became more and more politicized, it was often framed only as a two-sided issue, pro-life or pro-choice. And similarly, the opposition was labeled as anti-woman or baby killers. Rhetoric and feelings about abortion, inflamed largely by politicians who stood to gain political power from an angry and active voter base, led to violence. Beginning in the late 1970s, there was a string of abortion clinic burnings and bombings, as well as assassinations, assaults, and kidnappings of abortion providers, resulting in property destruction, injuries, and at least 11 deaths. And those continue to today, as recently as the murder of three people in a Colorado Springs Planned Parenthood in 2015 and the arson of a Knoxville Planned Parenthood on New Year's Eve 2021. For each act carried out, there have been hundreds more threatened, and each threat has to be treated seriously, which can mean temporarily closing down a clinic or having to hire extra security, and both mean greater operating expenses. The combination of ever-increasing state restrictions plus threats of violence caused many abortion clinics to shut down, and states continued to tighten restrictions and push the boundaries of what Roe and Casey allowed. From the 1990s through the 2020s, Arkansas passed a large number of bills testing the limits of abortion restriction, such as a bill requiring an investigation to see if a woman is getting an abortion because she doesn't like the gender of the fetus, and another bill which mandated that doctors seek the input of sexual partners and family members regarding how to dispose of fetal remains. These and similar laws have been largely rejected by the courts, though some pieces of them remain in effect, and one, which we'll get to shortly, may be about to take effect. But first, let's talk about the state of abortions prior to the overturn of Roe. Abortion rates in the U.S. have fallen significantly. In fact, the percentage of pregnancies that end in abortions is now lower than it was before Roe v. Wade. Most of this change is attributed to the widespread availability of birth control, but the increasing unavailability of abortion facilities and stricter state laws also play a role. According to the CDC, the U.S. reached its lowest rate of abortions in 2017. It upticked slightly in the following years, reaching a ratio of 195 abortions for every 1,000 live births. In 2019, 79.3% of abortions were performed at or before the nine weeks mark, during the embryo stage. Another 13.3% were performed between the 10th and 13th week. 
That's a total of 92.7% of abortions performed within what was under the old Roe framework, basically the first trimester. About 56% of those were surgical abortions, and about 44% were done by medicine. As far as safety goes, in 2018, the most recent year with reported data, a total of two women died in the U.S. as a result of complications from legal-induced abortions. This is significantly lower than the average rate of pregnancy-related deaths, and that's especially true in Arkansas, which has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the U.S. As of 2021, there were two outpatient providers of abortion care in Arkansas. Planned Parenthood Great Plains provided only medication abortions and only up through the 10-week mark. Planned Parenthood had locations in Little Rock and Rogers. The second provider was Little Rock Family Planning Services, which provided medical abortions over the same period as Planned Parenthood, as well as surgical abortions through about 21 weeks. That's just shy of what's now considered the point of fetal viability, and also the latest point allowed by Arkansas law at the time. State law requires two clinic visits, first for a state-mandated pre-abortion counseling, followed by a minimum 72-hour waiting period before the procedure. Various other restrictions were also in effect, and more were on hold pending court decisions. So that was the landscape leading up to 2022. The other important thing to know is that the ideology of the Supreme Court shifted significantly during the presidency of Donald Trump. Each of the three presidents preceding him, Clinton, George W. Bush, and Obama, had served two terms and successfully appointed two Supreme Court justices. But President Trump, despite serving only one term, appointed three. This means that he and the Republican Party were able to rapidly change the makeup of the court. Anti-abortion state legislatures saw this new court as their best chance to overturn Roe, so they began to draft two kinds of laws. First, laws that were in clear violation of Roe and could be appealed up to the Supreme Court, and second, trigger laws. Laws with a built-in clause saying they weren't in effect yet, but would be triggered and take effect if Roe were overturned. Mississippi did the former, passing a ban on most abortions after 15 weeks. That case is the one that reached the Supreme Court in December of 2021, and the one for which a draft decision leaked, indicating that the court was going to overturn Roe v. Wade. The overturn of Roe would mean that there is no single federal law or precedent about when abortions are or are not legal, and when something is neither explicitly protected or denied in the Constitution or at the federal level, then it's up to the states to decide. Arkansas passed a trigger law in 2019 which would specifically go into effect under those circumstances, and here's what it says. Quote, A person shall not purposely perform or attempt to perform an abortion, except to save the life of a pregnant woman in a medical emergency. Doing so is an unclassified felony with a fine not to exceed $100,000 or imprisonment not to exceed 10 years or both. Unquote. The law defines abortion as, quote, using, prescribing, administering, procuring, or selling of any instrument, medicine, drug, or any other substance, device, or means, with the purpose to terminate the pregnancy of a woman, with the knowledge that the termination by any of those means will, with reasonable likelihood, cause the death of the unborn child, unquote. And it defines unborn child as, quote, an individual organism of the species Homo sapiens from fertilization until live birth, unquote. The law also defines which kind of medical emergencies would allow for legal abortions. Quote, to preserve the life of a pregnant woman whose life is endangered by physical disorder, physical illness, or physical injury, including a life-endangering physical condition caused by or arising from the pregnancy itself. Unquote. The law prohibits charging any woman with a criminal offense in the death of her own unborn child. And finally, the law explicitly does not prohibit, quote, the sale, use, prescription, or administration of a contraceptive measure, drug, or chemical, if it is administered before the time when a pregnancy could be determined through conventional medical testing, and if it is sold, used, prescribed, or administered in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions, unquote. The law ends by setting the conditions that would trigger it, an overturn of Roe by a constitutional amendment or by the Supreme Court. Once either happens, the state attorney general would certify that the law had been triggered. So, the law is generally straightforward. No one can provide an abortion ever, and no one can sell or buy for someone else anything intended to cause one. And the only exceptions are some specific instances to protect the mother's health or life. Note that when naming those exceptions, the law repeatedly specifies 
physical illness or injury, a clear indication that mental health is not included. Also not included are exceptions for rape, incest, fetal deformities, or a pregnant minor, which were previous exceptions. There's also some gray area where the law says that contraceptive measures or drugs are allowed so long as they are used before you can know you're pregnant through, quote, conventional medical testing, unquote. Currently, the most common methods for early pregnancy detection only become accurate around the time of the first missed period, which is about one month into pregnancy, counting by gestational age. So what does that mean for emergency birth control, sometimes called Plan B or the morning after pill? These are hormonal treatments which can be taken within the first five days after sexual contact, and they work in the same ways that other hormonal birth controls do. Prevent an egg from releasing, prevent sperm from reaching the egg, and or prevent implantation if sperm and egg do meet. Under the Arkansas law, this would likely not constitute an abortion because it's done before a woman could accurately know that she's pregnant. This is despite the fact that using the definitions of the new law, an unimplanted embryo still counts as a preborn child. That definition also brings up another sticky area, in vitro fertilization, or IVF. IVF is most commonly used by couples who haven't had success when trying to have children. During IVF, multiple eggs are harvested from the woman and fertilized in a lab. Those embryos are allowed to grow and multiply until they reach the stage where implantation is meant to happen. At that point, scientists use a set of criteria to select the most healthy embryos, and some of those are transferred to the uterus where, hopefully, one implants successfully. Under the definitions set forth by the Arkansas law, each externally fertilized egg would constitute an unborn child, and with every IVF treatment there are multiple embryos created. In many cases, more than one embryo is used per implantation attempt, with the intent that only one of them will implant and survive and something also has to be done with the embryos that weren't used. The IVF process seems to necessarily involve fertilizing multiple eggs and then taking actions which guarantees some of them won't survive, but does that count as abortion? The new law defines abortion in part as terminating the, quote, pregnancy of a woman, unquote. If that excludes IVF embryos, then it would mean, according to the new law, IVF embryos are unborn children, but killing them is not an illegal abortion. So now that you know what the law says and some of the complications in its wording, let's talk about the effects of its implementation. In 2020, the latest year with available data, 3,154 abortions were performed in Arkansas. It's unclear what percentage of those would still be allowed under the new law's definition of a medical emergency. Unlike the old 21-week ban, this new law lacks exceptions for rape, incest, and underage pregnancies. Since rape and incest account for about 1.5% of abortions nationally, we can very roughly estimate about 47 abortions in 2020 were rape or incest cases, which would no longer be accepted. Also no longer accepted would be the 88 abortions performed on women under 18. If a woman in Arkansas wanted to get an abortion for any reason other than the defined medical emergencies, one option might be to leave the state, but all the states that touch Arkansas will have near-total bans on abortion as well. While some of the adjacent states have additional exceptions, the nearest abortion clinic in a state without a trigger law or an existing abortion ban is, depending on where you live in Arkansas, either Kansas or Illinois. But there is one final option. Abortions by mail. Back in 2000, the FDA approved a home-use version of the same set of drugs clinics use to induce first-trimester abortions. They do require a prescription, but because of new laws enacted during COVID, they can be prescribed by telehealth and mailed to a patient. Arkansas doesn't allow this, having passed a law that a doctor must be present even for medication abortions. The state also outlaws doing that by telehealth and mailing abortion pills. But there's a catch. The new Arkansas abortion law makes it illegal to provide an abortion, but not to receive one. It, and other abortion laws in the state, exempt the pregnant woman from being charged with a crime. So if a woman performs an abortion on herself, guilt falls only on whoever provided her the means to do so. Meanwhile, states like California have started passing laws saying they won't penalize doctors who provide telehealth abortion services from California to states where it's illegal a woman from Arkansas could find a doctor in California to prescribe the abortion pill and have it mailed from a California pharmacy. 
Arkansas says it will prosecute these cases, and California says it will defend them, which likely means another Supreme Court fight. And things get even more complicated when you factor in other countries. Right now, there are abortion rights groups who will ship the abortion pill to America, knowing states are unlikely to try and take international legal action. Abortions by mail are likely to be a legal war zone in the near future. But in the meantime, a woman in Arkansas who receives and uses the abortion pill is not doing anything illegal according to the new law. So once the abortion ban in Arkansas becomes law, how might it be changed in the future? Let's start at the top level and work our way down. It's possible, but unlikely, the U.S. would adopt a constitutional amendment setting abortion freedoms or restrictions. It's also possible that the federal government could pass legislation, and if they did, that would supersede Arkansas law, barring any oversight by the Supreme Court. It's also possible the Supreme Court could hear a new case in the future where they rule differently. But if the law isn't overridden on a federal level, then any changes would have to come from within our state. Because it's a state law, the Arkansas abortion ban could be changed in the future either by the state legislature or by a citizen's initiative. The state legislature is more or less free to expand or scale back the law at their own discretion. It's not clear what changes they might want to make in the near future. Governor Asa Hutchinson has said he supports expanding exceptions to cover cases of rape and incest, but the legislature doesn't have to listen. So the final way the law might change is a citizen's initiative. Arkansans can enact our own legislature through petitions for ballot initiatives or constitutional amendments. If Arkansans voted for a state constitutional amendment changing the abortion ban in some way, that would override the law and couldn't be overturned by the state legislature. On the other hand, if citizens passed an initiative which requires fewer signatures to get on the ballot, it would create a new law which would override the old one. But laws made through an initiative can be overturned by a two-thirds vote of the legislature. The Arkansas House and Senate both voted for the abortion ban by more than two-thirds, so they could overturn an initiative. But those same legislators may not be in control for much longer. Because 2020 was a census year, all the legislative maps were redrawn recently. And because of that, in 2022, every single seat in the state legislature is up for election. Not only that, but many of the people who will be in charge of rewriting, reviewing, or enforcing this ban will be up for election as well. That includes the governor, the attorney general, and loads of other state officials. And that's not to mention our federal senators and representatives, some of whom are also up for election and could change the laws on a federal level. So the 2022 election is likely to have a big influence on what happens to this abortion ban in the future. And if polling is anything to go by, it's pretty clear that a total abortion ban is not what most Arkansans want. Every year, the University of Arkansas conducts a poll of Arkansans asking their opinions on a variety of topics, including abortion. And year after year, the poll has shown similar results. A majority of Arkansans want some restrictions on abortion, but do not want a complete ban. Regardless of what your opinion of abortion is, hopefully you now feel like you have a better set of tools to discuss it and how it affects our state. And whether you want things to change or to stay the same, you need to get talking about this. Get informed on who might represent you and go vote. Not only that, but in between voting, call your representatives and give them your opinions. Show up to public hearings when new laws are being passed. Sign petitions for citizens' initiatives and constitutional amendments. Get involved in the way our state is run, and you can help shape the future of this and every other law in Arkansas. And that's it. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, you can hit the subscribe button and join us for future explorations of Arkansas politics and history. And if you want to help us create more videos like this, consider donating to Arkansas on Patreon. Patreon is the easiest way to support content makers in a way that works for your budget. You decide how much you want to give each month, and you can change that amount at any time. Bigger donations get bigger perks, including a sneak peek at our upcoming documentary about the myths and truths around the reputation of Harrison, Arkansas. And Speaking of perks, thanks to our current patrons Zach Green, Alan Archer, Jordan Little, Blake Hulse, and Poetize the News with Deanna Starshine for making this video happen. Thanks again, and see you next time for more Arkansas.